thank you so much for doing this with me today. Thank you, Patrick. Sure. And, uh, you know, I'm with Amanda Curtin, LICSW, who uh, identifies as a childhood trauma therapist and also does couples work and individual. And that's in kind of context of the group work? Is that? It, it usually is, yes. I have some couples that do couples work in a group on the same model, and right. then I have individuals who do it, and sometimes I'll see people, uh, oftentimes see them um, in the individual as well as they're going through the group. Right, right. You know, one thing that I've always been fascinated about by you is just basically when, when someone starts to do your group work, it's like they catch a bug and they go to friends and spouses yeah. and partners yeah. and they're like, you got you, you to do this work. This yeah. lady's amazing. I have really never advertised. It's all word of mouth. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I found you in the, in the like yes. early 90s. A, yes. a buddy of mine was doing the work at a group work with you and I just mm -hmm. said I was struggling and he's like, you got to see Amanda. That's mm -hmm. the person. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you did. Yeah, because yeah. here we are all these years are. later in yes. your living room, you know, <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> um, so I was also thinking that, you know, thinking about how long you've been doing this? About 33 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And can you think about how many potential groups has there been within that time period? You know, of like... I, I, re I run groups that, my groups are on average um, three years uh, but but it, give or take, some groups go shorter. Very few go shorter. Some go longer, up to four years, four right. and a half years. Um, and and I run. I've been running between five and seven at a time. So maybe you know between 50, 75 groups wow. total. <laughs> wow. During that time. And then multiply that by however many people are in those groups. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Usually about eight people in a group. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot of people. Well, how, I'm just curious also too about like, how did it kind of come about? Because as a therapist, it's sort of like you go through a master's program or some kind of like PhD program where there's a lot of like academic training yes. and a lot of classwork. Yes. And then you're usually in an internship getting your, you know, like everyone's green. Yep. Everyone's just trying to get their way through it. But how did it go from that into developing RRP? I was really lucky because when I had my first internship, uh, my boss there wanted me to do a group and it was just a regular group just a psychodynamic group mm -hmm. and I just fell in love with it and then my, for my second year I went to a major mental health clinic and they had uh, a cognitive behavior unit they had an addictions unit sexual abuse unit and regular mm. therapy Whoa. and I got introduced to all of these uh, modalities which was amazing and uh, initially I had thought, I was trained psychodynamically the way that you are in social work school. Mm -hmm. And um, I just felt like I was looking for something more. And I got into cognitive behavior therapy. And, and that's really talking about how to change your beliefs, uh, how to work with feelings, um, tends to be present focus. Yeah. And I saw people get better, but I still felt like there was something missing. And <clears throat> through, the, through my work on the alcohol unit, I got introduced to 12-step programs. It's really changed my life because you're watching people transform. And um, mm -hmm. there's a very specific model. There's a lot of, of tools and uh, people have to support each other. So there's that group aspect that's so critical to 12-step programs. Right. And a lot of my model came out of my experience in getting to know 12-step. Right. And that person going to 12-step can get the beginning of feeling like a community and a yes. little bit of like you know if it's a good group or a good like network of people a little bit of surrogate family yes absolutely in a, in a very yes. new healthy way with like a kind of a healthy framework yes. underneath it and the, that second year I was sitting with my super, my alcohol supervisor and saying to him you know I just really want to do group and I really feel like there's something uh, beyond even 12 step and he said I think people have to do their childhood work and it was almost like a light bulb went off. And he, had, right. he was running six-month groups uh, around childhood trauma. And oh. so that became the basis of what I started to do. Mm. And, uh, yeah, and then I started building the model. Wow. You know, a second ago you mentioned more present focus work that yes. happens in things like CBT yes. or 12-step, or where the yeah. person is just, you know, trying to be their best or trying to get it together mm -hmm. in the present moment. But, you know, make the distinction between past and present because primarily yes. the work that we're doing is past focus. Yes, it is. Um, it, in my groups, uh, I let people know that we are not going to deal with the present issues that are going on in their life. 
which is a big shift for them. Right. Most of them are coming in with you know career issues or marital issues or parenting depression, issues. parenting. You know, just yeah. and um, what I say to them is that uh, the key to shifting those is in the past. And what I mean by that is that we all start out uh, as kids with a certain program that comes to us because of our childhood experience. Kids are like sponges and they kind of take, take on whatever the parents are mirroring them, whatever right. experience forms them. And very young, mm -hmm. they get this program. Yep. And that program is really hard to change. It's kind of cemented in. Yep. And that's why I tell people when they come to me that although I think awareness is an amazing thing, it's a very first step and that awareness doesn't shift you in the deep way that I'm talking about in terms of changing that initial program. Yep. So the work that I do is to change that initial program. Right. Do the, is there, you know, I'm sure that's not a hard and fast rule that when someone comes into a group and they just had a, had a massive fight with a partner or right. their kid needs an IEP or something yes. like that, you know, yes. like how do you manage it in the moment, you know? We have a check-in in the beginning of group before we do the actual work of the group where each person has a few minutes to say something. Mm -hmm. And if there's something major going on in their life, we're going to pick it up energetically anyway. I ask them to at least say, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend and I'm really upset. Yeah. Um, and there may be a little bit of time of support around that, but... These groups uh, are very specific. It's, it's really, in a way, like taking a course. It's a very structured process that I've developed. Mm. And so, uh, and I want people to get through it as fast as they can because yeah. it's really hard work and I want them sure. to get to the present. And so right. if I let people talk about the present and really focus on that, we would probably never get through the work. And so right. people know that when they sign up. Clients know that. And they also know that in, in my groups, you're allowed to have contact outside of group. And so... If you have an issue, you can talk about it outside of group and get right. support around it. Which I gotta say is so groundbreaking because yes. it so <laughs> goes against what clinical yeah. psych might say that yeah. it that it takes away my experience that it ha enhances the whole experience yes. where traditional psych would say that it, it diminishes the experience in the room or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it it totally in my view yeah. it enhances it, it enhances it and and people will tell me at the end of the group it's one of the things I love about group is they right. end up with really close support system. And many of my groups go on to continue to meet as a support system. People end up with friendships that are lifelong and uh, communities are being formed. And also right. people know other people from group and so they connect and you know it, it really begins to build a, a huge community of people. Cool, cool. And I'm sorry if my brain's still stuck on it, That's but okay. just like that past. So the person, <laughs> from what I know, is just basically the person comes in with a with a triggered bump and something like that. Yeah. They can talk about it in group and get some momentary. Yeah. But really, as as group leaders, we're kind of trying to go for the main issue at hand yes. and really figure out what the person got triggered to. Yes. And it might be helpful to just talk about the three goals of the group because that will give mm -hmm. you a sense of, sort of what we're focusing on. Right. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. sure. That'd be great. So the first goal is for each person to go back and, and relook at what happened to them as kids. Mm -hmm. Some people know exactly what happened. Other people have a lot of memory gaps. So and true. Some yeah. people are, are in denial about parts of the story. And, and so the work of the group initially is everybody does a genogram, which is a three-generational look at their family yep. and looking at the patterns. And uh, we're kind of getting to know the cast of characters that form this inner child. And so being able to have someone stand up and tell their story and show their genogram is an amazing experience. Right. And you learn so much about people and you start to see why they have the beliefs they have, why they have the, um, why they deal with their feelings the way that they do, all mm -hmm. of that. Right. Um, and so, so from that, and, and, and some people get challenged around that. So for example, you might have somebody who says, my father was a monster, you know, I, he, I was scared of him, he was an alcoholic, he wasn't safe, mm -hmm. and my mother was a martyr. And I'm sorry, <laughs> and my mother was um, amazing. She was a saint. Sure, right. And so uh, the group might say, uh, after hearing the genogram, well, we get that your father was difficult. Yeah, what was going on with mom? Yeah, how come yeah. mom didn't stop it? Right. And, and you know, <clears throat> my sense is that parents are 50% responsible each for what happens to their child. Right. And so once we get to the truth and, and sort of understand what the story is um, about each child, then we have to do um, the finishing business with it emotionally. 
And mm -hmm. by that, I mean, I use... Um, is this the second part? No, or this, or? this is still the first goal. Got it. So there's first, you know, understanding, making sure that we know the story of the child. And I would say... And what the truth is. And it's kind of an exercise is. about the truth. It is about the truth. Because there's a lot of family myths yes. that happens in yes. dysfunction. Yeah. And how I, how I do that is I spend a lot of time doing research around what a healthy parent should do. Uh, what uh, what kind of experiences a child should have in order to be set up for a good experience as an adult. So true. I find that that's a missing ingredient when yeah. we talk about this stuff, or in society in general, because yeah. I feel like our, you know, there's, there's a lot of good in the world, but basically yeah. there's a lot of toxic parenting. Yes. But people don't have a reference point for like, you know, I might say that myself in some way about like, well, this is a healthy mom would have been right. checking out like what was going on with you about that person or that uncle and That's being right. really, or even that the healthy parent would be present enough to know that something was going on for yes. you. Yes, Kids are born screaming for help and something shuts them down. If, if a child is not telling a parent that they're upset, something has happened to make them know that it's not safe to do that. Mm -hmm. So... Um, from that, so experiential therapy is really about creating new experiences that change the old ones. And it is, I have a, probably 15 or 20 different kinds of experientials that people do. Um, they can also make up their own. But I'll give you sort of a basic idea of what sure. one would be. Um, you might put a picture of, let's say, your father, especially one when he was young and, and parenting you. And you put it in the chair mm. across from you. Mm -hmm. And then beforehand, I have the person write a letter uh, on behalf of their inner child to say to the father how he parented this child and how this person feels about it. Mm. And it is incredibly powerful. Yep. And in fact, people are nervous about it at first, but as they start to do it, they literally can see the parent in the chair. And a lot of feeling comes up and a lot of truth telling happens. And it's incredibly healing. Yeah. Because basically what we're doing is we're really having uh, an opportunity to have this child have their day in court, to finally have the, speak the truth and right. have their feelings about what happened. Right. And I'm, I'm assuming that that person needs a lot of help maybe knowing what the truth is. Yes, that's the so, first part, is yeah. really looking at and right. make sure that, the, that they know the truth. Um, yep. and, and the group is incredibly helpful with that. One of the things I love about group is that mm you can see somebody else's stuff more clearly than your own. So you have a room full of people really paying attention and they see stuff that they can then reflect back to the person in, in an amazing way. Right. And coming back to that piece about what normal parenting would be yeah. is, wouldn't it be amazing when we were 10 years old that there was a healthy aunt or uncle yes. who could come in and say, you know what, your dad was really off about yes. that whole yes. thing. And yes. I just want you to know that I see that and I know yeah. that. Yeah. Like in what you just described in the empty chair, yeah. experiential might be the person the, the person's first experience of yeah. someone saying like, yeah. whoa, he was so off yeah. or she was so off. And you know, the, the other issue that often comes up with people is uh, about what is trauma? You know, what do you consider a traumatic childhood? And mm -hmm. I have a much broader definition. And again, based on, on the research that I've been looking at uh, about what trauma is. Yeah. And, you know, often in the beginning, it was just, you know, you have an alcoholic parent, you were sexually abused, you were beaten. Those were really yeah. clear traumas. Really blatant. Really blatant, yes. Yeah. Um, now we're starting to see that one of the biggest traumas is neglect. And for many of my clients, they were like, I never saw my father, so it wasn't a problem. Well, you didn't have a father. That's a yeah. huge deal. And, um, the, uh, and the other thing that's hard about that is you can't really claim it. You're not having scenes of abuse, but it's every day he's not there. And so that's yeah. a huge deal. He's a mystery. He's a mystery. He's and, a stranger. And, um, and the other thing is, uh, what we're learning is that it's the emotional um, attachment uh, between the parents and the, and the child that is most critical in terms of whether a child does well or not. Mm -hmm. And so that's often hidden. You know, you can have a family that looks pretty good on the outside, the kids look nice, they go on vacations, they you know, seem okay but feelings are just not tolerated. Um, and, or there isn't mm -hmm. enough warmth, or there isn't enough uh, physical touch, um, yeah. or certain emotions are shamed. Um, and so that has just opened up, uh, to, to me, the field of trauma, to, to include a lot more people who were excluded before. Right, would it also include the relationship of mom and dad? Like Absolutely, yes. Yes, because when you're thinking about what I call the children's bill of rights, the things that they should see that make them, you know, uh, able to be 
to grow up in a healthy and uh, environment and get what they need. Uh, watching the parents, you know, what kind of relationship do they have? Uh, that modeling is critical. Yeah. Um, how limits are set, very critical. Right. Um, whether or not uh, emotions are um, modeled by the parents or even uh, parents help kids get in touch with their own emotions and feel that they're validated by yeah. the parents. There's all kinds of stuff that we haven't been talking enough about. Right. My favorite piece, because I use that your that childhood yeah. bill of rights as well yeah. from the um, from my supervision with you. Um, people really get an emotional connection. One on there is the ability to affect somebody. Absolutely. That's and probably I, one of yeah. the biggest ones. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, and I when you think like when we think about like what does that mean? Is just basically what, can you expand on that one just a little bit? Like, yes. I mean, you. There's a difference between affecting somebody and controlling somebody. Um, you want mm. you want your parent to be affected by you. For example, if they're doing something that upsets you, you'd like them yeah. to actually make an effort not to do it. Right. Um, and to be able to speak up and say, you know, Dad, when, you're, when you tease me that way, I really don't like it. And you'd want your parent to say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, first of all, yeah. and I'm going to work on not doing that. Right. Instead of stopping so sensitive or yes. don't take it right. so seriously. I'm just, right. Yeah. And actually even upping the teasing. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Keep it going. Yeah. 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 Well, very cool. So basically, with the model, you know, sort of like sort of the genogram work yep. is usually the beginning. Yep. And past focused yep. into experiential into work. Into experiential work. And the other thing I'd say is it I it's often been called a grieving group. And that is because I think the the biggest loss that you can suffer as a person is the loss of a good enough childhood. And so we're mm. grieving and using uh, Kubler-Ross's model of going through the stages of breaking denial and then um, being able to be angry and sad until eventually you get an acceptance and you can move on. Wow. So yeah. we're doing that for the inner child. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy about blaming parents and whether that's a good or, or not thing to do. And what I tell people is that I think parents all do the best that they can do given what they went through. I mean, there's two things can be true at once. I can know that my parents didn't get what they needed, and they're just passing on to me what they got as kids. Sure, right. But at some point, and this is where, um, to me, this work is just a, a temporary piece of work, we have to be able to say to the child, it's okay for you to be angry and sad about what happened to you and to have your day in court. And yep. then I think when you do that, you move from what I call a head forgiveness to a heart forgiveness. I think people right. often say, I've forgiven my parents, yeah. and um, they probably have in their head, but right. if you haven't done the inner child work, if the inner child is still hurt by what happened, and you still carry what I call a well of pain about it, um, then you really can't have a heart forgiveness. This work really yeah. allows you to heal your heart, and, and what I have found, it's a beautiful thing to see, when people's hearts are healed in a good enough way, the, the love for their parents is, gets stronger. And, it's, and I think yeah. we're here to, to have that progression. Right. I think people try to jump over that, and, it's, and they have what I call so true. A, a spiritual bypass. Right. Where they do it in their head, they don't deal with any of the pain inside themselves, and they go to, I've forgiven you, and then... Right. Would you see someone who's doing a head forgiveness be overly hard on their partner? And that's Absolutely. Where it, <laughs> that's a good point. That's yes. where that's yes. where that's where it comes yes. out. Yes. That's where you know what I've yes. learned from you is like basically like you know like it's almost like a Bessel van der Kolk like the body keeps the score the, yes. like that kind of a thing yeah. where I find that is a lot of trauma survivors just really hard on our partners yes. and that's where the well yep. would go. That's where they're where they're safe. For example, you might have uh, let's say that uh, a husband forgets an anniversary and. Um, the, the wife mm. is devastated right. and um, you know come to find out that uh, she her birthdays were never celebrated she never felt special in any way with her parents and most of the time her, her husband's a really good guy and shows up but this yeah. one thing triggered all that right. old energy it goes on him he feels terrible and maybe defensive and they fight and it's actually energy that belongs to the family not to him right and he has his own inner child too in some way that it's just triggered. like they're yes. on this cycle yes. with each other and maybe he never did anything right as a kid and so then when the wife says you messed up he goes back to all the times he was right. told that he he was useless and could never sure. do anything you know it's so interesting in a way that would you say that there's almost like a predictable pattern to this stuff when we just mm -hmm. talked about this this fictitious couple mm -hmm. in our head right mm -hmm. now 
you know, like she has her own trauma history. And then I sort of said, you sort of said, maybe he's somebody who could never do anything right. right. And, you know what I mean? Yep. Do you find that this at this stage in your work, is it predictable? Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. It's really amazing to me. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> most people would say it can't be true. Yeah. But how did you know that? So many people. Yeah. We are, we are, we bring together in terms of partnership. I think it's a beautiful thing, actually. We bring together people who trigger our worst places, and mm -hmm. I think it can re-traumatize us, and we can continue to, you know, have uh, fights about it, or we can use it as an opportunity to heal ourselves. And that's, I think, why we come together, partly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And a couple questions yep. would be, um, what is it like? To see someone change through that that process, mm. and what is the ending? Like, what happens from there? Mm -hmm. Like sort of genogram experiential yes. intimacy work. Yes. You know, well, let, yeah. let's go back to because we we finished the first, that was the first okay the yeah, first sure. uh, goal mm -hmm. right? which is to basically grieve the loss of a normal childhood and to finish business with mom and dad through experiential therapy. So that's the first goal. Okay. The second goal is to use the group as a place to learn about intimacy. Because as we mm. said, if we don't have parents who model good intimacy skills for us, if they don't know how to resolve conflict, which I think is a huge issue for most yeah. people, um, uh, that's, and when people don't get that and they go to, and, they, and they're not safe in their families or they're still having lots of, of issues um, around not getting what they need from their families, when they go into adolescence, they don't get the great experiences they need either to be able to be supported to practice intimacy skills. Right. And so a lot of my clients didn't had horrible intimacy had horrible adolescent times. And so right when it's a time to work out bumps, learn how yes. to date. Yes, all of that. Yeah, stuff. all that. Yeah, stuff. learn about feelings. Yeah. What do I like? What don't I like? Or how do I have a voice? Yeah, all a of healthy that. dramatic teenager. <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. so um, and so the group becomes a very safe laboratory for people to practice new skills. And I run mm. this group. I, I tell people I run it for the inner children. They can be complete beginners. And we start to uh, learn how to, uh, to, for example, the, the biggest thing to me is learning how to resolve conflict. People get triggered in the present. So something happens in the present that triggers you to that well of pain. Yep. And then all of that energy goes on to the person who triggered you. And mm. so there's what I call a bump. Yep. And then there's the well of pain that it, that it connects you to. And so my husband and I developed this tool. Oh, and, I, and I will say one thing that I think most people uh, deal with conflict, either having the same fight over and over sure. again, yeah. or they live kind of parallel lives and they don't fight, or they break up. Yep. And so the parallel lies thing is, I find that that's the hardest. Yes. Like yes. the couple who doesn't yes. fight. Right. Right. Yeah. And they, you know, it looks like everything's okay, but they never deal with the right. stuff that's really underneath. Right. So you and your husband came up with? Yes, we came up with this tool, uh, which is called the one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uh, a difficult tool. Um, and at first, you need a moderator to do it. But over time, it becomes something that you use fairly easily. Um, but it's, I, ha I have never found anything that works better. And it is amazing yeah. to me when I watch people go through it that literally you feel closer to the person mm -hmm. you've and you've resolved the bump. And that yep. is huge, huge there's, thing. There's some real magic yeah. to it. Yeah, there really that happens. Is. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And basically, like in a, on a sorry to summarize, quick, how, yes. like basically a, the one, the two, and yeah. the three. Number one is that you uh, recognize you're triggered, and you try to each of you tries with the other one's help tries to figure out where you got triggered back to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know immediately that was. That's just the phrase my father would say to me. Yeah. And sometimes it really feels like you don't know. Right. And that's where knowing each other's histories, like in the group, people sure. know their genograms. Yeah. Oftentimes people in the group can help you figure it out. Like you're right. feeling in the present right now. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? Yeah. When did you feel that way as a kid? Yep. And it's, um, it's pretty amazing uh, mm -hmm. when you finally can go, oh my gosh, that's where I got triggered to. Yep. And then you have to experientially heal from it. Mm -hmm. You can't just have the awareness because awareness doesn't touch the well of pain. So that, that, that whatever got triggered needs to get expressed. You don't yeah. want to express it toward the person who triggered you, so you want to take it back. So I use uh, three or four different things for that. Mm -hmm. One is just the empty chair. You mm -hmm. might put a parent in a chair and have some feelings toward that parent. Sure. Or your partner or a group member might do that for you, which can be very healing because you're kind of mad at them in the present, and then they're, here they are defending you, which yep. is really, really nice. Um, Whoa, yeah, yeah, that's 
So coming back to that couple, the couple with the anniversary yes. problem, yes. if they were doing this work, he would be upset at her parents on her behalf. Yes, yes. For not celebrating birthdays yes. or really seeing her. Yes, and and it's it's a fairly the problem with the one two three is that you're really mad about something in the present or hurt yeah, or feeling sure. you know really pretty right. awful, and when you start to hear the, another technique, this is a really powerful one, is you you ask the person to tell the story of what happened to them as a kid. And when you do that, it's very hard not to open your heart. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I remember a couple coming in one day and the husband was very shut down and the wife was livid and yelling at him. I think they'd had a fight in the car. Yeah. And they sat down and he started, I started to do the one, two, three mm -hmm. with them. And he started talking about something that happened to him as a kid. And I looked over and the wife was crying and she said, I've never heard that story before. I'm so sorry. It just shifted them completely. Yeah. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's step one. Each person has a turn, mm -hmm. both figuring out where they went and doing some kind of emotional discharge. Another technique around that would be to have the person, let's, let's say it's a group member, talk directly to the to the group member who triggered them, Talk, have them talk to your inner child and to say, I get what happened to you. I'm really sorry. It wasn't your fault. Yeah. And I really know that you were a great kid. Mm -hmm. So that's another one. And the final, final one was actually developed by a client of mine. It's really powerful. He came in really triggered one day by his partner. And he wrote down everything he wanted to say to her. You know, that kind of... Uh, yeah, you know, self-righteous yeah, kind of oh, fighting stuff. Yeah, all nasty stuff yeah, you yeah. Know, that you wouldn't want anybody to know. Right. He wrote it all <laughs> down. And then he looked at it and said, I want to say that to my mother. So it was yep. really powerful. Yeah. Right. So in essence, yeah. he's telling the truth when he gets triggered. The truth comes up about mom, yes. not the partner. Exactly. Right. Yes. So that's step one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. one two, three. <laughs> Takes a while. Yeah. Um, step two is to say how the person who triggered you is different from the parent you got triggered to, and the reason I do mm -hmm. that is because the inner child may say, "Okay, yeah, we went back to this, but you're still just like them." Right. And so you have to be very specific, like. Yep. You know, somebody might say to a group member, um, you know, you have apologized to me in the past. My, my parents never apologized. Yeah. Or even just, you're sitting here doing this work with me. Yeah, you, my mother would you, never do this. You agreed to go to couples therapy exactly. with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so uh, that's uh, step two. And that's a very touching time sometimes because you start to say what you really like about the person. And people can really connect in a very deep and special way when they do yeah. that. I find that the, the clients need a lot of help with it. Sometimes they do, yes. Because it's yes. sort of, they really, I don't know, I don't yes. know how he's, the, well, it's just like he's doing yeah. this with you, or yes. he, yes. he usually does remember things like yes. your birthday, yes. like coming back to that anniversary. Yes. Yeah. That's where the group is so helpful, because it is really hard sometimes, and, and group members can be, can make suggestions and say, don't you remember the last time how right. great he was with you when you were upset, right. and you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third uh, step is to finally deal with the present bump. And by that time, mm. you're usually in a different place. And sometimes people will say, there's no bump. I totally get why you did what you did. You get why I did what I did. Right. Um, and sometimes it actually hits a real present issue. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, in a group, somebody might say, you know, you do interrupt all the time and it really bothers me. And um, so there's a negotiation. I ask people to do, to do two things. One is, what can you own about the bump? Mm -hmm. Because as, a, as an inner child, we're innocent. We're righteous. We didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. But as adults, we usually have a, a part in a, in a bump. Right. And also, we didn't have parents who often owned anything. And it is an, it's such an important skill to be able to say, you know what? I really messed up. Right. But I find with a, with a trauma that is so shame-based, it's yeah. so dangerous to yes. own something or to be yes. faulted. You know? and, and so yeah. what this process does is it starts to show you how great that is. Yeah, and how so freeing that how is. How freeing it is. Yeah. And people get much, much better in, at owning. In sure. the beginning, it's really hard because mm -hmm. they think they're going to be seen as bad. Right. Um, so, for example, I might say, if, if I was triggered to my husband, I may, might say, you know, Richard, I was really sarcastic. Or he might say, I didn't call you back when I said right. I, I wasn't would. clear. I wasn't us. clear, yeah. yeah. And, and it just helps. Yeah. And then to ask for what you need. So, for example, mm -hmm. if someone um, feels like the group member is dom or dominates a lot of the sessions, yep. you might say, you know, I'd really like you to work on that. And right. then the person said, who, "Time listening instead yes, of yeah. yes." Like sometimes I'll even be really structured and say, uh, "Let's say for somebody who doesn't talk enough, like the group member who talks too much might say, you 'You don't talk enough.'" 
Yep. So I might give that group member the assignment of saying at least three things during a group session. It doesn't matter whether they make any sense or not, just, just force yourself to do that. Yep. Yeah. So we're looking for often a very concrete program um, right. where people are practicing something to change the dynamics in the present so they can learn yeah. something. That's a pretty rich experience, those three it pieces. Is. It is. It's not easy, but yeah. it's, it's pretty amazing. And the only the, the thing about the one, two, three is both people have to be willing. Yep. And it doesn't work if they aren't, or if one is willing and the other isn't. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, what from what from there? So. So that's oh, that's the, so that's the, the the other thing I would say about we're talking now about practicing intimacy in the group. Right. Um, and. I don't allow people to um, talk about outside intimacy, intimacy relationship problems that they have. So I want to talk about my husband or my pr boss or whatever. They have to talk about relationship problems within the group, which is hard. It's scary to say, you know what? Yeah. Uh, what right. you said two weeks ago really hurt my feelings in group. Yep. Or, um, and to be able to actually say that and then have a process around it yeah. is, is the work. I, I imagine, is that there so that those relationships with spouses and bosses and sisters and brothers gets more easier, like yes. more manageable if it's yes. done in the, yeah. Yes, because if you can do it, if you can learn how to do the one, two, three, um, you bring that with you wherever you go. And there may be, I've had lots of people teach it to their partners, or they may right. bring their partner in or their friend and say, can you, can we, can you teach us how to do that? Yeah. Um, but also, if somebody isn't safe enough or isn't willing to do it, at least you know. You can go through your own process of how you got triggered, and right. you can also know that they're triggered by you, and that well doesn't belong to you. And that's right. so helpful to realize. You know, when a lot of my clients say, now when people get really mad at me, I know mm. it's their well, and I'm not taking it personally. Right. Right. Yeah. I know, yeah. right? I think um, trauma is so shaming that I think that most people, when they get to some doing some deeper work, they think it's totally them, and it's always been them. Always. Yeah. Whether like the old yeah. boyfriends or the siblings yeah. or whatever, that they've only been, it's like, like you know, terminally unique kind yes. of a thing, that yes. they're the only one. Yes. Yeah, yes. so it's really freeing to just like be in a room full of others and know that your toxic boss isn't toxic because of you. Yes. Right? Yes, it's really helpful. Yeah. Yes, really helpful. Good. And again, so much easier to see from the outside so group members can, when you have a room full of people telling you something, it really helps. Yeah. I learned that from program. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. You said something earlier, and I wonder if you could span, expand on it a little bit about hard to explain about what does finishing business mean? Yeah. That's a good, you know, it, it starts really with, with, um, the well and and people ask me what's the well the well mm -hmm. is all the feeling that it wasn't safe to express when you were little and so for example if it wasn't okay to get angry in your family every time you were angry about something you had to repress it yeah and so you it builds and builds and builds and most right. people have a tremendous well they have no clue that it's there some people mm. know because they explode on a regular basis sure. but most of us have learned to kind of contain it right. and it often takes maybe a partner yep. for it to come out and so being able to, um, right. you know that you finish business when that well has drained and you're not mm. as triggered. But I will tell people, I don't think that it's possible to totally get to a place where you're not triggered and totally uh, have the, the well right. be gone. There's conditioning, yeah. It takes, a, it, I just think you can do a good enough job at, at, so you're not walking around with this huge well. Right. And it takes a lot to trigger you. And, and when you are triggered, you do know what to do with it. Right. But we're really trying to, you know, these feelings need to be released. And they are released mm. through the experientials and through finishing business with mom and dad. It is, it is literally, oh, yeah. I should say something about experientials because why do they work, you know? Why, yeah. why can somebody sit in, in, and talk to an empty chair and have it work? And I think the reason is that the unconscious can't tell the difference between a role play and a real event. So that when it's happening, it's, yeah. it, it's as if it's happening to the person and it replaces old scenes and it's right. part of your history now. Right, and is the unfinished business finally the opportunity to say, you know that wasn't okay? That's right. Or That's you right. know like, yeah. why did your feelings have to always come first dad right. kind of a thing? Right. And, and you know, it would be wonderful if you could do it with the person uh, most people have, that I know who have tried this, they end up getting a lot of defensiveness from their parents or denial yeah. or even even some you know bad right. consequences. Sure. Um, sometimes it does work, which mm -hmm. is great, but I would say often it doesn't. Or if a parent's died, 
you can't finish business with them. And so yeah. this is a way to do it. And also, I would say that when you're, when you're doing a role play, you can say really awful stuff. Like you can say, I hate you. I wish you'd die. Yeah. And the reason that you need to do that is you got to get it out, but you don't want to be a perpetrator. I would never say that to a real person or a real parent. Right. And so we're doing it in a way that um, allows it to come out, and yet um, nobody gets hurt. Right. And nobody's abused. Yeah, and it's also the experience of like having a parent. A parent can be a very toxic parent yes. in their 30s and 40s. That's right. Where like, you know, but... You know what happens to when they when you know often a toxic parent might mellow out yes. and be a better grandparent. Yes. Absolutely. So it's yeah. hard to just kind of like yeah. call up mom, call up dad, yeah. and like I want to talk about my yeah. teenage years. Yeah. And that's again, um, people. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about rage work because I think sure. a big part of this work is recognizing that we have a lot of rage. Rage mm -hmm. to me is anger that's been suppressed and has, has built up over time. Yep. And I have found that anger needs to be expressed physically to really release it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why there's a lot of violence. People are expressing oh, their anger. Oh, sure, um, especially now. And yeah. so I, I have a room next to my office where there's a concrete wall and a huge punching bag, and people can punch the bag with a bat or throw dishes against the wall. Wow. And it's amazing. It's wow. amazing to be able to have that rage release not hurt anybody, not go against your value system, not be a perpetrator, but really get it sure. out. Sure. Yeah. Inanimate object yeah. to an, it's just an yeah. expression of emotion. Yeah. And people will say to me, well, why do you need to do it? And, you know, I'll, what I'll say to them is your, your child has these feelings. When someone really, really is scary or hurtful and, and over time, these are the people who are supposed to love you and be safe, um, you're mm -hmm. going to have all kinds of revenge fantasies and nasty yeah. thoughts. And I don't want the child to be shamed about them. I don't right. want them to pretend they're not there. I want them to get it out in a way that's really safe and nobody gets hurt, and then they're gone. Yeah, right. And I imagine the person, it might translate into something like road rage in the present. Yes, totally. And when they start to do some yes. anger work, and that yes. kind of, they're sort of maybe pot potentially draining that well. It's amazing how people change around yeah. their rage. Yeah, it's cool. really true. Well, wow. And what about sort of, you know, we should do the third goal, too. Yes. yes. Okay. That would be so, a good yeah, idea. Yeah, that would be yeah. good. So we can at least finish that. Let's see. Sure. The third goal is, even though the experiences are very powerful, and mm -hmm. um, I think people who go on weekend workshops will come back and say, wow, I had an amazing cathartic experience, and it really, isn't, it really changed me. I have found that over time, it fades. And yeah. it fades, and then people are back to the old belief systems and old ways of behavior. And mm -hmm. it's really discouraging. And so I realized that I needed to find a tool that would solidify the, the change of, of experience that the experientials brought about. And I found this tool called dialoguing. And that was from, the first person I heard about it from was Lucia Capaccione, mm -hmm. who was an artist working with blocked artists, and she would have them use their non-dominant hand to get unblocked. And then she got into her, her own uh, inner child recovery and found that the non-dominant hand connects to the part of the brain where the inner child experience is stored. And so... Would that be like the limbic system, amygdala? Yeah, yeah and, it's, yeah. and it, it really is... Um, one of the things that's most fascinating to me with the brain research is that traumatic events are not stored on the timeline. So therefore, when you go back to one, you have no clue that it happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. Right. It feels like it's happening now. And so... Right. Um, so, the just technically, what you do is you write back and forth between your right and your left hand. You get a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and let's say I'm right-handed, so this is my adult. I might write a question to my child, and then put my pen in the other hand, and then the child responds. And mm -hmm. it is unbelievable what comes up. Yeah. And I think you get feeling and information that it might take years of ther talk therapy to get to, if ever. It's just right. incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And what what I tell people is, when you dialogue, you're going to be, it's as if you have a foster child come and live with you, and you know their history, mm -hmm. and you're going to be their new parent. Mm -hmm. So of course you would talk to them about what happened, and you'd help them to have their feelings and know the truth about it, but you'd also be parenting them every day, and being the mother or father they never had, which means... Right. Um, saying that you love them, saying that, uh, mm -hmm. talking to them about their concerns, um, being able to constantly have communication with them in the way that they didn't get growing up. Right. So I have clients who have, you know, 
hundreds, really, of notebooks of dialogues because they're yeah. dialoguing all the time. And literally, the other thing about brain research is dialoguing is repre- reprogramming the brain. So, sure. so that uh, you know, neurons that fire together wire together. You're basically changing these your brain chemistry with the new information. Mm. And so that's why it's so important to when you've had an experiential, for example, then to dialogue with it. Let's say you had an experiential where you finally went, "Oh my God, I wasn't a dumb kid. I was actually smart, but I was told I was dumb all the time, and they were wrong." Yeah. Then I would have them maybe do a 30-day dialogue program where they dialogue every day and reinforce this with their kid. Remember, you're not dumb. Let's right. talk about it. Let's have some more feelings toward mom and dad. Mm. I want you to tell me all the ways that you felt smart today. I'm going to tell you some ways I saw you being smart today. Mm. A lot amazing. of repetition. A lot of not repetition. Not just kind of poof. Because as you know, good parents, yeah. they have to repeat over and over again. Wow. And yeah. these, these things that got cemented in came through repetition. So it's repetition that replaces them. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You know, what kind of like what kind of repetition would that be? Like the the trauma of repetition. You, you mean know? uh what what would you say or or like an example of it, you know yeah. what I mean, for a kid growing up. Yeah. Like where if it takes if it takes a long oh, time to yes. uncondition. Well, you know? I had a client once. This was actually with a real child and mm. she uh went through a divorce and she discovered that her little girl, I think she was probably six, really believed she caused the divorce. And so what she did yeah. was for a period of two or three months, every night at bed, she would talk to her little girl about it and say, you know what, you didn't cause this. And she would answer questions and be able to have her child have feelings about the divorce, but kept coming back to, you didn't cause it. Wow. And she found that over time, her child took it in. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have we left anything out? No. It's hard to just I, talk I about like the whole of, program. I know. And, and no, I think you've done a great job. I th- yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. That was really clear. That was that was also really eye opening and, and inspiring. Oh, kind of hearing you. you about sort of like um, lots of just different yeah. different like angles of it. Well, you know? and, and you know, I I want to say one more thing about group because I I think most people are would be nervous about group and maybe resistant to group. Um, and yeah, no one's psyched. Yeah. <laughs> I rarely get someone saying, I oh, want to do group. Uh, I, once in a while I do, which is wonderful, but very rarely. Right. And um, it, it is, uh, we think about our first family was a group. And having mm. another experience of people, you know, having, if you had a violent father, let's say, having men in a group who are amazing and are gentle and listen to you so and true. are safe sure. is really healing. But I, I think that there's... Um, I go very, very slowly in, in, in when I do these groups. I want yep. people to really take their time, see if I'm safe, see if the other people are safe. Right. And we don't even do experientials usually for six to eight months because it wouldn't be safe. Yep, so absolutely. It's just a very, very slow process, and um, rarely do people uh, find that it, it's too much for them. In fact, they start to see the value of it and start to really look forward to coming. Right. And I find I also find that a shifting point for in my experience is when other group members see a one two three done between yes, people, and when they thing. and yes. when they see like oh my god no one died yes because yes. conflict is so charged for yes. them they may they yes. may feel like they want to get out of the room because people are sort of talking about feelings you know I I used to teach the one two three to couples in a couple session mm-hmm. and then I found doing it in the couples group was so much better. People watching someone, just like you said, they'll see a couples see group. A couples group with just couples learning the one, two, three. I see, yeah. And watching another couple go through a one, two, three, it's so clear what's going on. But when you're in the hot seat trying to do the one, yeah. two, three, it's really confusing. Yep. So it and same with group. It's it's really it, group is so great because you can learn so much watching other people, sometimes mm-hmm. more than what when the focus is on you. Very cool. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for doing it. I hope we can do this again. I would this love is that. Very enlightening. And wonderful. Okay. Thank you.